We've got numerous ancient sources that report that the disciples were willing to suffer and willing to die for their beliefs. Uh, whether they all died as martyrs, that's up for question. Certainly they were willing to die as martyrs. And we know that several of them did, like Peter, Paul, James, the brother of Jesus. We know that they died as uh, a martyr. We actually have no good evidence to suggest that Paul or the disciples or the apostles ever died a martyr. Generally, the argument that Peter or Paul died as a martyr rely on Tacitus, Suetonius, and Acts. Acts is definitely historical fiction, as proved by Richard Perbo in The Mystery of Acts. The problem with the other two sources, Tacitus and Suetonius, is that neither of them actually mention Peter or Paul at all. One of the big problems with Tacitus is that the burning of Rome wouldn't have required Paul to recount his faith, even if Tacitus had mentioned him at all. In fact, there are no sources that talk about the martyrdom of Peter and Paul for 200 years. There is a lot of confusion surrounding when and where Paul and Peter died, not even to mention whether or not they were martyred. 1 Clement 5 has Paul dying in Spain while Peter dies in Rome. Some bad comprehension skills in the 2nd century has both Peter and Paul dying in Rome at the exact same time. Then in other sources, they have them both dying in Rome, but at different times. This kind of confusion only comes from people that don't know what actually happened. What this comes down to is that we cannot substantiate the claim that the originators of the Christian cult actually died martyrs. You see, the originators of the Christian cult would have preceded Paul, and we don't know how they died. Christian apologists have accepted that Peter and Paul died as martyrs as an apologetic for their faith. If they're all dying for the gospel proclamation, and then you go out and you're proclaiming the same thing after seeing your colleagues die for doing the same thing you're doing, well, that shows that you're willing to die for it as well. And all this suggests, not that the resurrection is true, but they sincerely believed it was true. So they would not believe that if that's not that's incompatible with them stealing the body so no one really takes that position in fact i don't know of any even skeptical scholars that have taken that within recent years within several decades now that there was a stolen body well we can't establish that they did die for their gospel message by the time that we can establish that christians were being martyred and persecuted for their faith they were far removed from the people that actually originated the religion so those Christians that were dying for their faith wholeheartedly believed in their faith as being true. But more importantly, they didn't think it was a lie. Just to remind you, I do disagree with the stolen body hypothesis, but it's still vastly more likely to have happened than Jesus resurrecting from the dead. As we established in the previous video, most of the scholars that would disagree with the stolen body hypothesis as a viable option are required by their faith to believe in the resurrection or are contractually obligated by the teaching institution that they work at or go to. Although, Lycona is talking about skeptical scholars in this particular section. These skeptical scholars would include people like Bart Ehrman. Even Ehrman thinks that the stolen body hypothesis, however unlikely, is vastly more probable than Jesus resurrecting from the dead. The other option is that someone else stole the body. But here's the, here's the deal there. When we read the gospel accounts, the empty tomb didn't seem to convince anyone, possibly the beloved disciple, okay? But other than that, None of the others were convinced, none of the disciples were convinced that Jesus had been raised from the dead. In fact, Luke reports that when the women came back and said they'd seen angels and that the tomb was empty, they thought the women were telling frivolous tales. I like how one of their main arguments for the empty tomb is the criterion of embarrassment. This would be the embarrassing fact that the women were the first ones to find the tomb empty. Here, Lycona is using the women finding the tomb as a way to downplay the importance of the empty tomb in converting people to the faith. My question is, how can this be an insignificant thing when it's one of the main arguments to convince people that the resurrection happened? Now, Lycona has worked extensively with Gary Habermas. Gary Habermas has these things he calls minimal facts, which the empty tomb was part of those minimal facts until he downgraded it. What I'm saying is, is that they use these arguments when it benefits them, regardless of whether or not it contradicts other arguments that they have. 
Also, it depends on which gospel you read, and every gospel has something different for the finding of the empty tomb. Actual historians will go with the earliest account that we have. That would be Mark. In Mark, the women find the tomb empty and then run away scared, never telling anybody about it. In the original ending, a 2nd century Christian actually added the longer ending to Mark in order to corroborate the post-resurrection appearances that appear in the other Gospels. This would be an example of a later Christian fixing something they considered embarrassing. The other Gospels have the disciples believing the women or woman immediately. I don't know why you act like Luke is the absolute correct version of these mythical events. No one believed based on an empty tomb. Certainly Paul would not have believed based on an empty tomb. Paul the first thing he would have suspected if the tomb were empty would have been theft. They believed based on the appearances Paul believed because he had an experience he believed was the risen Jesus appearing to him. Um, and the disciples believed because they had experiences they perceived were appearances of the risen Jesus to them. Theft just does not work. This is interesting because Matthew actually does have an apologetic for why some Jews are saying that the disciples just stole the body. So the stolen body hypothesis has actually been around since people started claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. It's the oldest argument against the resurrection and it's still way more likely than Jesus actually rising from the dead. Also, if the empty tomb failed to convince the supposed eyewitnesses of the event, then why should it convince people now? Why is this part of Habermas's minimal facts if it's not supposed to be used to convince anyone? The whole empty tomb argument at this point really confuses me. Anytime anybody brings up the empty tomb as proof for Jesus' resurrection, you need to ask them how do they know that the tomb was found empty. If they say the gospel, then you can tell them that the gospels are not reliable because they aren't eyewitness sources, they don't name their authors, and they only cite scripture as their source. They also happen to be influenced by the writings of Paul. Paul never indicates that the tomb was found empty. So there is literally no evidence in history to support the claim that the tomb that Jesus was supposedly buried in was found empty at any point in time. 